I'm Sandy Wu Cater, and I'm a local subject matter expert on human trafficking issues. I also serve as vice president for the Bakersfield College Alumni Association. May is Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And on behalf of BC's Social Justice Institute, I have the great honor of welcoming you all to BC's AAPI Heritage Month Conference. This virtual event is co-sponsored by the Levin Center for the Humanities, the Office of Student Life, and the Equal Opportunity and Diversity Advisory Committee of Bakersfield College. This conference will highlight various experiences within the Asian American community. You'll hear from Joseph Tepe, artist, filmmaker Marissa Arroy, and poet Portia Choi. As our three speakers prepare to share some of the lived realities of our fellow Asian Americans, I'm reminded of the significance of this conference, especially given the escalated acts of violence against Asian American communities across the country in the past year and a half. The dehumanization of peoples has been at the root of these atrocities. As a Chinese American woman, a daughter of immigrants, and a new mother, witnessing and experiencing these acts of violence in the only home I have ever known has impacted me in ways I can't put into words. To be met with xenophobia in my own country has left me speechless and heartbroken. But I, along with many others, persist with hope and the intention to rewrite the narrative and protect our stories from erasure. For those viewing this conference tonight, if you identify as Asian American, I hope the words you hear this evening will offer you a sense of peace, solidarity, and empowerment. To allies of Asian American communities, I hope you find this conference to be an invitation to continue amplifying the diverse voices that continue to shape our country's landscape. With deeper understanding of each other's stories, there is no room to fear difference. Rather, there is a pathway to honor triumphs and resiliency and to value the interconnectedness of humanity. This level of empathy and understanding will be the driving force behind transformative solutions to the injustices that we witness in our communities. And now to start this conference off, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker. He's an internationally recognized award-winning artist and professor. His current work involves large-scale woodcuts that investigate the effects of incarceration. Please help me welcome Joseph Tepe. Wow, that was so beautifully said and very touching. Um, very, very honored to be here. Thank you everybody for your space. Thank you for inviting me. I have some wonderful stories to share. Um, just let you know that this is my journey. And uh, some of you guys, some of you folks out there can relate to my journey. Um, my journey is specific to where I grew up and how I grew up. Um, and remember, we are not a monolithic people, but we share, we have shared experiences. So hopefully you can learn something from my story. Um, it's about a bit of pain and a bit of trauma, but in the end, it's triumph. Uh, and the main message is through my, through my story and through my work is always uh, hope, community, uh, support, and healing. So um, through my work, I strive to make each piece to heal myself, but at the same time, share it with other people in hopes that they can learn from it and also heal. With that said, I'm gonna share my screen really quick. So, this is the part that we will cut out. Okay, Joseph Tepe, that is my name. Um, a little bit about me. I'm from, uh, I went to the Academy of Art University in San Francisco and also went to San Jose State. Um, and I'm, I, I identify as Filipino, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and really growing up in the Central Valley, um, there's a lot of Filipinos, and sometimes we're spread out. Uh, but when I really learned how many Filipinos there were in the Bay Area, I was like, oh, there we are, right? Um, I also went to Fresno City College where I'm when, uh, originally from. 
And I spent some time in Hawaii. Uh, and also that was another space where I really learned about my Filipino side. And I really learned about the Asian American experience. And in a space like Hawaii, where um, you blend right in, like it's, it's so diverse and uh, it's such a, a loving, warming, embracing community. Um, and I, I, that aloha spirit will always stay with me forever. So I really appreciate everything that I've learned um, in all these spaces that I've been. So a little bit of back, I'm a professor at Bakersfield College. Um, I work with uh, incarcerated students uh, and I have taught at 11 facilities. So these are uh, private prisons, which have been turned into detention centers. That's another talk. Um, and also women's facilities uh, and um, various different facilities throughout uh, the valley from all the way from uh, Merced, all the way down here to Kern. So I've uh, been a lot of spaces. I've taught, again, everywhere from Merced to Mendota, Fireball, Avenal, um, Delano, of course, Bakersfield, uh, uh, Madera, Fresno. And the one thing I learned about all, about all these places is that we are all similar people in the valley. We all have similar stories uh, and, and, and we are all hardworking individuals um, who, who are striving for a better self. And, and we're also very communal. That's one thing about the Central Valley is we are all in it together. Um, I exhibited internationally and um, I'm, I'm, I've, I'm privileged to be able to share my story and my work uh, around the world. So I am an artivist uh, and, and I saw a post somewhere where you're, you're not an activist uh, because you choose to be, you're an activist because uh, there's something in you to help your community. Like you didn't choose to do that. It, you have to do that. You have to tell the story. And that's how I feel. So the word we use is artivism. So it's art and activism together. And what is that? It's uh, using the power of art because art, art is a very powerful tool. It's an extremely powerful tool. Um, and I'm using it as a tool for social change, for progress. Okay, I get this question, uh, where are you from? And it depends on who asks this question, right? Because this question could be problematic. Like, who, where are you from? And it, it depends, right? Like, what do you mean, where am I from? Like, I'm, I'm from over there, like right here, Cedar and Shields, I'm from the east side, east central side, right? Or it, depending on the spaces, if it's where are you from, homie, it's like, oh man, I got time for this. Uh, so where are you from? But I'm gonna answer where am I from neighborhood-wise. Fresno born and raised. Anybody out there in Fresno or around Fresno? Fresno and Bakersfield are so similar. Uh, when I came to Bakersfield, I was like, whoa, 99 divides these people, these people are over there, uh, east side is this, like, oh, I figured it out already. Like redlining is the same, uh, all the way up and down 99. Um, so I am from the McLean neighborhood, it's East Central Fresno. Uh, and I did, I did some digging because I knew this growing up and I, and I searched around like, well, what is the demographics there? Because it, it feels very brown. Right, and growing up, it felt extremely brown. Uh, so, fifty-four percent Hispanic, fifteen percent Asian, and eight percent Black. And so of course, there's some Native Americans. Um, and I did have some whites uh, growing up in school. Uh, and I remember only the two white kids in my class were immigrants from the Ukraine, and they were cool. Like they were, you know, I learned a lot from them. But um, <clears throat> definitely a very diverse population and 15% uh, Asian. And a lot of it is Southeast Asian. So predominantly Hmongs, the Hmong community. So all my, my Hmong homies out there, what's up? Um, okay, so I'm gonna pull out some data because that's what we do. It's, it's not all about uh, teaching, uh, showing art and stuff. That's the cool part, but we also have to learn a little bit. That's the part of activism is each one teach one. So I found this, a new report about Asian American and Pacific Islander workers in California found that working Hmongs along with native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Californians struggle disproportionately with poverty. 
And the San Joaquin Valley has the highest proportion of Asian American and Pacific Islanders workers struggling with poverty. And for me, this is something that I don't need data to tell me this. I don't need an article. These, these are lived experiences. These are the folks that I lived amongst and I am a part of that community. Um, so this, this just goes to show that uh, we'll get to the, the, the whole idea of the, the model minority, but this goes to show that there's just a lot of myths and stereotypes out there about the Asian community. Um, and we're, we're about to break those. Another question I get, and you guys might get this too, what are you? Well, what are you? We look at you, I can't figure you out. You're dark, you're brown, you don't fit into this. Your last name's weird. What are you? I get it all the time. What are you? Maybe I should do like Pablo Picasso's quote, what is art, what is not art? So the question is, what are you? And the quite answer is, what am I not, <laughs> right? Because we're mixed people, uh, especially when I was trying to dig through some of my history and asking my family around, um, I'm indigenous, so indigenous from Mexico, and uh, from the Philippines. So uh, uh, Bisayan, Spanish, French, somebody told me like, I had a Filipino student, a Filipina, and she told me, I don't think you're Filipino, you sound French. And then I looked it up and I'm like, yeah, I probably it's like I probably could be French, and then from the the Mexican side, I'm probably French too. Of course, I'm Asian, Latinx, I'm Mexican, I'm American, I'm white. We have to put it. We have to check that we're white too. A funny little story: when my daughter was born, who's also mixed, she is also my wife is Filipina and Mexican uh, as well. She's Tapia, and I'm Tapay. Tapay. Um, on the little card, when my daughter was born, they checked off white and Chinese. Like they, they just guessed. I'm like, eh, I guess. So, but what do I identify with? Uh, a lot of the other, a lot of uh, these other titles, but for me, it's Filipino and Chicano or Chicano and Filipino. And I say in no order. There's no, it's, you flip flop them around any way you want. There's no order. Well, then how, do, how did my family get here without doing the whole uh, Ancestry.com thing? In a nutshell, my family came from Lete um, and they, they settled in the, my great grandparents settled in, central, in the Central Coast in Oceano and Guadalupe, uh, which is a farming town. Um, and uh, my great grandfather ran a gambling hall I don't get any information. So uh, I'm gonna say allegedly he ran a gambling hall. I don't know. Um, but I heard he was a cool cat. I heard he was really cool. Uh, he looks just like me. Um, but my, my great grandfather, no, my grandfather was born here uh, in San Luis Obispo. Um, and this generation, we're talking about the 40s and 50s. This generation was the Americanization generation. Like they were taught, it was taught. Like it was, you, even in schools and in, in, in the community, it, it was a program where you Americanize, you fit in, um, you, you, you were taught the Anglo customs, you, 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 even though you had your own way and things were passed down, um, pretty much the idea was to assimilate and, and, and be as American as you can. And a lot of that meant don't speak the language, you don't need to teach your kids the language on both sides, on the Chicano, on the Mexican side and on the Filipino side, because they're from the same era. You don't speak the language. You don't want your kids having an accent and because you, you don't want them to face discrimination. That's the idea. So get in where you fit in, don't make any waves and uh, be as American as you can be. Whatever that means, I don't know. I don't know what it was to them back then, but John Wayne, I don't know. By the way, my, my grandpa loved John Wayne movies though, I'm not gonna lie. <clears throat> okay, so we have this statement here by Andrew Yang and I'm just gonna, it's, it's a little, let's just go through it. We Asian Americans need to embrace and show our Americanness in ways we have never before. We should show without a shadow of a doubt that we are Americans who will do our part for our country in this time of need. And he's speaking about now with the rise of the hate, right? Whew. 
yeah, I got some problems with that. And, and the Asian community does as well. Um, because like, how much more do you want to show? What, what, what else do we need to do to approve our Americanness? What more do you need from us? Haven't we done enough? Well, what does it mean? Okay, so, and I grew up like this, right? I grew up knowing some of my history, kind of not really. I didn't, I didn't grow up. My parents didn't teach me any of the language, just a little bit. And because I lived in an immigrant community, I picked some up, right? I, I picked things up from my friends, from, you know, my friends barely came from Mexico and then I had a lot of Southeast Asian friends. So I picked things up from them. Um, but really this was it. This was, you're an American, you just, go to school, you don't get in any trouble, you work hard, you get good grades, um, and you prove, you prove that you belong here, right? Um, and so G.I. Joe, the real American hero, that was it. You, you fall in line and you, you, hey, then maybe you go to the military and both my grandparents were in the military. That, that's another way to Americanize, to prove that you belong here. And that was a thing like, well, maybe you can go to school, but if not, there's always the military. And there's nothing wrong with the military, but these are the things that were, you know, I was taught that to just be good, be a good boy. That's it. So, and the question is, and this happens to a lot of us, right? We go through this and we say, you know, I remember in, in an assembly singing that one song, I'm proud to be an American, or at least I know I'm free, right? I had sing an assembly and I felt it. Like, yeah, this is, this is the 80s. This is Reaganism. This is patriotism. I, fed, I was spoon fed that. But there comes a moment where you realize like, wait a minute, hold up, time out. Like, am I American enough? This is what you want? Like, when do I, when, I keep proving myself, but uh, I'm not American enough, right? This, this comes a point where you look around, and you're like, everybody looks like me. Everybody's, you know, we're all, bunch of brown folks and we're all going for the same thing but but then there's that one click where it's like I'm not though I'm not and you're telling me and you're showing me I'm not and this is this is all this is wrong so <clears throat> a few things happened to me back to back to back I went from the grade school kid to being proud to be an American um, and then at age 13 barely got into junior high I go into an apartment complex to, to pick up my friend <clears throat> and an older white man comes out with the gun and he points it straight at us. And he says, we know you did it. I know you did it. Show me your hands, show me your cans, whatever he was yelling at me. Uh, I watch anime, so Demon Slayer, his eyes were like bloodshot like Demon Slayer. And I thought like, oh, this guy's, some, something's wrong with him. Um, he thought we vandalized his apartment complex or his property or whatever it was. And he was pointing a gun at us and we were kids. And I'm looking around like, what? And then his wife comes out and screams at him to put the gun down. And I remember at the time not being afraid. I remember at the time being very mad, just being very angry. Like, how could you do that? When I didn't even do that, right? But you're going to, point a gun at me and kill me over some paint. It was very confusing at the time. Um, and it reminded me what happened uh, in last year, I believe in St. Louis with a couple came out pointing guns at everybody. It's like, wow, that's still going on, right? Um, another thing is at 15, so two years later, I was walking to the library. That guy always do looking for something to draw, going to the library straight up the same street I went on since I was a kid when my mom would take me and I got pulled over by the police. I got stopped. I was walking. They pulled me over, went through my backpack. It was empty because I was getting books. They asked where I was going. I'm going to the library. No, you're not. You're lying. Where are you going? What gang are you in? I'm not gang affiliated. You're lying. Take off your shirt. What? Show me your tattoos. Looking around like, man, this sounds illegal, but I'm only 15, so I don't really know. They take my picture, say a bunch of mean things to me. They talk crap to me and they let me go. And these aren't white cops. These, these cops look just like me and they let me go. 
They put me in the gang database. If I would have gotten in trouble, I didn't. I would have had an enhancement. I would have had a gang enhancement. Um, and then two years later, I was picked up for curfew. And I have my issues with curfew. Like, I wonder if white kids in Clovis and neighboring city had a curfew, if they got picked up for curfew, if it was only for uh, kids of color. But I got picked up for curfew. That means being out after midnight. I'm 17 years old. Of course, I'm hanging out with my friends. Um, and I got picked up. I didn't have any, nothing, I didn't, wasn't doing anything wrong. They gave me a ride to the, uh, to juvenile hall and they gave me a rough ride. So what they did was they went as fast as they could and broke as hard as they could until me, uh, two of my friends were tumbling in the back of the van uh, like ping pongs, right? Uh, at the highest speed they could. I didn't know I was a victim of police brutality. I thought like, wow, I, I got banged up and bruised up, but you know, at least I didn't break my ribs or anything. My friend was in really bad shape. He had knots all over his head. I didn't know I was a victim of police brutality until Freddie Gray. I was like, wow, I just, I just thought that's what they did, right? See, because I was conditioned. Um, those three events would totally change the course of my thinking to way like, wait a minute, this is, we live in two different Americas here. This is not what I was told and sold growing up. This is not the, you know, be a good old American boy and just do what you're told and, and don't get any in trouble. This is something else, right? This is, this is something different. Um, so this piece was inspired by that concept. Um, and I call this piece, my America, uh, because the America that, that is for other people looks a lot different. So my America, uh, if you look in the background, there's two bandanas. Um, I grew up in a known gang neighborhood and, 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 and the Mexican gangs and the there's Southeast Asian gangs. Um, and we were all, we were all a bunch of poor kids, a bunch of poor, scared kids trying to protect each other. Now I wasn't gang active, but that's really what happens. There's a lot of gang violence. There's a lot of uh, poverty, drugs and alcohol and, and stress. Um, and that was what I thought in my community, uh, a lot of racial tension. Um, so I made this piece. I made this piece because this is exactly how it was. This is my brother-in-law. And uh, I was in the studio and he was on parole and he was waiting, hanging out. And he was telling me his story. He was locked up since he was 13. Uh, he was, uh, uh, he didn't have a chance. He was into youth authority, in and out of prison uh, his whole life. He was in solitary for two years. He told me that uh, he felt like he was a dog chained to a small fence, a uh, small uh, rope. And when they would let him out, he just felt like he wanted to eat everything. He was so angry. Um, and that really was his gun. That really was his shotgun. So I'm, I'm telling it exactly how I see it, but I know it because this is what I know. Right, a bunch of kids who, who feel like they don't have an opportunity, and, and and they don't, they don't have a place, and so they find comfort in joining a gang because they have, they get the respect and they get the power, uh, and they become noticed and and they feel safer in their communities. So, and this is made out of wood. This is a woodcut, so it's a woodblock print, which has ties to China. So the China in seventh century invented the movable type with the wood blocks. And then Japan in the eighth century. So this also ties to the, the Asian American, the Asian culture, Asian American culture, and also the Chicano culture with the print. So this is kind of like all of my histories and my art form all in one. And this is how big they are. They're really big pieces. Uh, and I spent a lot of time on them, but really when I'm doing something so repetitive and carving, what it does is it allows me to be with the piece and really think about things. So it, it, when I say it helps me inform my trauma uh, and it helps me with my mental health, like I really mean that. So the question I get is, well, how did you make it if this was your reality, if you grew up in a place with gangs and all this stuff and community, uh, Asian Americans, Latinx community, we're collectives, right? We're collective cultures, we're a communal culture. So we look out for each other, tios, tias, ninos, ninas, everybody, aunties, uncles, grandparents. Um, I was raised by everybody. Um, art, art, college, 
ethnic studies. And I'm gonna say this again, ethnic studies. How did I get knowledge of South? If all I knew was violence and drugs and gangs and, and police brutality and all this stuff, all in this space, how did I learn about the things I know now and say, wait, this ain't it. We are more than that. We have these struggles now, but this is this that does not define who we are. So that's why I say we need an ethnic studies program at BC. I, there was an ethnic studies program at Fresno City College, ethnic studies program at San State, right? And so that's where I really learned like to love myself and not be ashamed of where I come from and to be proud of where I come from. Um, speaking of where I come from, so this piece, I I made this piece and I, I was sitting in the studio and I was writing my dad a letter. My dad was incarcerated. Uh, he had been incarcerated for two years at this time. He had been battling incarceration for the last 30 years before this in and out of prison. Um, so I really was writing a letter and the letter said, dear dad right here, your, your father, my grandpa, been to pay passed away on the 16th, but your grandson was born, right? A week later or vice versa. Your grandpa, your grandson was born on the 16th. So, and that's the reality of prison, right? It's like, I have to tell him in one letter, something terrible and something good. Cause you know, and that's the truth. And that's my truth. And there's a letter with him writing me back, So he's responding to me. And so on the left, there's no color. There's no color in prison, color, prison is dull. They don't have no color. And then on this side, I'm showing me and my daughter and my son, and this is the valley, the land, the, the, the green, the space. And so these are the letters back and forth. And this is, at the time, this was the realest thing I ever done. And I, I, wasn't, I wasn't even ready to share this. This is just my way of documenting my history at the time. And then their show comes up. Uh, I get an email saying they're interested in some artists in the area. area so I submit to this show. And this show is called Manifest Justice. Um, and it was a really huge show in LA. Uh, Dolores Fuerte was there. The show was all about uh, social justice. It was right after Trayvon Martin. And that's where I really felt like I had a place. I had a space where before I didn't think anybody cared about what I had to say. Nobody cared about mass incarceration. Nobody cared about people in prison. They're just throwaway, right? And then I found this space that's like, wait a minute, there is more that we do care. And, 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 and this is where I really thought like, wow, like, okay, it's working, it's working. And so Dolores Huerta was there. Uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, founders were there. Sabrina Fulton, Trayvon Martin's mother was there and Emory Douglas from the Black Panther Party was there at the event. And among others, there's so many like celebrities and musicians and other artists that I looked up to. And some of the graffiti artists that I looked up to were in this show. And I was like, man, I almost died because of graffiti. I didn't even do at 13 and now I'm in the show with my favorite artists. So it's like full circle stuff. After that show, it was picked up, uh, my work was picked up by the California Endowment, and then it traveled. So these two pieces, right, that I was just telling my story, this was my personal story, I shared it to, to the world, um, and, then, and then it went on a tour with Schools Not Prisons, and it traveled to 10 cities, and it came back to Fresno. It came back to my hometown, and then I did an event, and I did live woodcuts, and, you know, I was able to see people interact with it some more on my home space at Fresno City College, where that's the first job I got printmaking and you know, as a professor, as an adjunct. So it was a really full circle story. School to prison to deportation pipeline. Deportation, Southeast Asian American youth who came to the US are Children fleeing war and persecution with their families are subject to the same systemic marginali marginalization as many other communities of color in the US. Failing schools, multi-generational poverty, racial profiling, over-policing, and mass incarceration. Yet for the immigrant youth, 
who have not naturalized, the school to prison pipeline may end up in deportation and permanent family separation. So I made this piece and I was really thinking about the school to prison pipeline. And this is my daughter and she's mixed, but she's Filipina and Chicana um, and my godson. And they were just playing with blocks, that's it. And I captured this moment and in the back of my head, I thought about her grandpa, her grandpa is still locked up and she hasn't met him. Her uncle is still locked up and she hasn't met him. And she's innocent, right? And, and she should be having a, a innocent youth. She, she shouldn't have to be knowing these things in the background. But the truth is that that's, that's how it is for many children. That's how it is. Like 2.7 million children have incarcerated parents. I lived through parental incarceration now. My daughter's living, she's system impacted as well. Um, so it's really brought up a lot of things. And um, and I think that 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 this this keeps going on, this piece at the time, like even thinking about now the the deportations and the, the uh, families separated from their children separated from their families, like it takes on many more levels than even just a simple intergenerational incarceration, incarceration, so. And here's my children, and they're looking at, this is them and their family. This was that another big show uh, in Los Angeles with, with, thrown on with the same uh, event crew. Um, so a very big social justice show. This is a piece I'm still working on, and it's, it's kind of the same thing. Where I'm still thinking about deportations and and and, and um, detention centers, or um, I'm thinking about like children being away from their mothers, and and how I could relate to that uh, as somebody who was separated from their parent for off and on for 36 years of my life, right? And so it's very simple, but I have these little tally marks here uh, to show time. And then I'll show you really quick how it's printed. Let me turn off the sound because it's just, it's just some, I'm probably, probably rocking some Kendrick Lamar or something. Uh, this is called an intaglio print, so it's done on a plate. Similar to how it was done during the days of Albert Durr and Rembrandt. So, and I'm still working on that. It's, it's, still, it's still in progress. Aging prison population. According to the re uh, report by Reuters in California, seven, percent of the state's 130,000 prisoners were over the age of 60 in 2016, the most recent year for which the data was available compared to just 1% 20 years earlier, according to a report by the California Department of Correction and Rehabilitation. So I'm gonna, again, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna play this and talk over it because this is done on Procreate. So this is done on the, uh, this is done during COVID and I didn't have access to the studio. My studio was in Fresno. And so I had to find a way to still get things off my chest. And so I really started thinking about the aging population, uh, the aging population, and um, how, how as a collective, right, a community that takes care of their elders, and how, how, how will that happen in prison and what it looks like? If there's a huge aging population, then what, who's going to take care of them? And it, it kind of, when I would go on one prison, on the yard, I would see a lot of wheelchairs and walkers and canes and hearing aids. And, and I'm used to seeing really big tough guys, right? That look like everybody could beat you up. And to come on a yard like this, I was pretty shocked to see this, to see it for myself. And I really started to think about it. I really started to think, think about it during COVID. Like these people are gonna die. They're gonna die alone without their families. And, and it's, it was just sad to see it in real life. And so I, I needed to share this with other people, I needed to get it out there to the world. So here's what it looks like done. And I'll just show you real quick because my students like to see the progress and this is kind of what it looks like on the actual app. If you're not familiar with uh, Procreate, it's a, it's a software and you just, with the pencil, you just draw directly on it. And so this probably took me like two weeks to do. It's line by line, it's called hatching and cross hatching. And so really, it's the same thing. I do these crazy things where it, it takes a very long time, but it helps me really think about what I'm doing and, and really be in tune with it and, and really feel it emotionally in my soul. 
so where I'm not just doing art to just like throw it out there, but I'm really attached to it. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It's artists, right? We do these things that um, it's an insane amount of uh, of patience. <laughs> okay. During the prison boom of the 1990s, the AAPI prisoner population grew by 250%, while a disaggregated, while disaggregated data shows that certain Asian subgroups such as Southeast Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have significantly high rates of arrest and incarceration. And who bears the brunt of incarceration? Who is system impacted, right? I think about the kids, I think about the families, and I also think about the women. And I heard one of my, students incarcerated students say mom's always got my back everybody's ghost everybody left and she's the one, only one who comes every visitation i heard that with my ears and i thought yeah I, you, I feel it because that's the truth right um so this one i called uh mending so even though this is a bandana which represents a gang right it re represents a neighborhood um, in particular, the neighborhood that I'm from, which it, it comes up, it's a motif that comes up quite a bit. Uh, she's, she's still mending things, right? She's still clothing and carrying. It doesn't matter what the cloth is. It just matters that this person is the son, right? This person um, is in this situation that still needs my care and attention. And that's the motherly bond, right? The, the, that's the, the, the idea of the mom, the selfless mother. It could be a, a wife or a tia or a sister, right? But this is celebrating the women that uh, that are invisible, because all we see is the, the think about the population as just uh, the male population, and not think about everybody else who is affected. We are not your model minorities, man. <laughs> if this whole thing showed you, like this is that's a bunch of you know what to say, like. This group can do it. Why can't you do it? That's a division. That's that's sowing division amongst groups. Even our even even the group of Asian Americans, right? And you got one group it's like, okay, well, the Japanese can do it. How come uh, the Hmongs can't do it? No, that's not the way it works. Because we're you're not lumping up. We need to focus on the groups that need help, right? Uh, because we know systemic racism is the problem. It's the root of all this, right? And so, how do we focus in, in helping this group when you're not going to acknowledge that like it's not about one group just being like oh they go with the program so they're cool no we're all in this together we're all in this we're all in the same space right um and and this piece i was really thinking about um the justice system uh, another reason why i didn't get caught up in the justice system is because i know how ruthless it is i grew up in court it's boring it's not fair. It's like, man, that doesn't sound, you know, uh, visitation suck. You get on a bus and you go way far. You know, you got to go long distances. It's expensive. It's long and it's boring. And you only get to see somebody. So all this stuff, it's like parole and probation. It's like, what? you can't, we can't go here at this time. We can't take me to McDonald's because it's what time? You're, they're knocking on the door right now. Like it, that, that's the whole system. And it's a bunch of traps. There's a bunch of, like I said, a bunch of little traps for people. And it's easy to fall in, right? It's easy to fall right back into that system because, oops, there's a trap right there. Dang, I forgot about that one. Um, so that's why I really made this. It's, it's like, uh, um, again, he's trying to move up for the generation, but he keeps getting pulled down by the same traps. It's that system. It's, I call it the spider web. I have these here because it's like this web that you're trying to get out of, but you're, you know, you, you're trying to find your way, but you, you keep getting stuck. And I see it all the time. I unfortunately see it with a lot of my family members, a lot of my friends, um, stuck in the system, stuck. Solidarity. Why is solidarity important? The national poverty rate was 15.1% in 2015. It's gone down just a little bit post-pandemic. We'll see what it looks like while the rate for African-Americans was about 24.1% and for Hmong Americans, 28.3%. Because it doesn't matter, we're all in this together. 
black and brown folks. I think about the, the, the folks I grew up with in my neighborhood. We all struggled together. We were all in it together. Like, you know, the homie over here, he just came here. That doesn't matter, we're still friends. You don't have anything to eat. Come to my house, you got some food. That's how it works. And that's how it needs to be in the community. It's not like, well, they got all the food, so forget them, they're good. And it's it's their fault, or it's their fault there's hunger, it's their fault they're starving, it's their fault they're, they're victims of crimes and all. Yeah, that's the same thing, right? It's the division. The seeds of division are being sold for a reason. We just got to understand that, like, you can't blame this group. We're all in the same thing together. Um, and so I, I made this piece because I, I was approached by a group called Reform Alliance. And it was uh, Meek Mill, Jay-Z, uh, Robert Kraft, uh, Dan Jones. This is, this, uh, they started this after Meek Mill uh, was going back to prison and they're trying to get him free. Um, and they gave me a quote saying, uh, a Jay-Z quote saying, when, when one person is in prison, we are all in prison together. And I, I really felt that quote. And uh, I was working at Avenal State Prison at the time. And I walked in and I, I, I was teaching in the visiting uh, room and I walked in, I looked down and I saw Jenga. I saw like a bunch of games and some kids toys and, and there was a little play area. Um, and it made me think back to my childhood because I had been in that place before. I had visited my father in Avenal State Prison and now I'm a professor teaching an art class in the Avenal State Prison. I would write my dad letters and draw pictures from him to connect, to just to show him, right? That's why I kept drawing was to show him I was doing good things, like to be proud of me. Send me letters to Avenal State Prison among a lot of places that I teach now, Wasco. Corcoran, <laughs> a lot of these places I'm in, I've been there before, I have written letters before as a child. And so I really started to think about that. And so this reminded me of my experience that um, it doesn't matter where your parent is at, your parent is still your parent. I made it where I'm at because my father taught me and raised me through prison, through walls. He maintained that relationship. I have friends from down the block that they don't have that relationship and their fathers live in the same city. So uh that's possible and it happens all the time so i have i have students who are incarcerated and a lot of them are parents most of them are parents so i kind of see that right i i see what's happening and 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 i see that there's a lot of youth coming up now that that are system impacted and we really need to think about them as teachers the background is orchids so the pattern and that stands for hope so i added that right there um, and this is my last piece before we have some questions. And <clears throat> um, this was the hardest piece to make uh, because I was dealing with some trauma at the time. So uh, my Nino, my godfather, was uh, he was my mentor. He was an artist. And he created a lot of uh, murals in the community. He was a sign painter. Uh, and I learned art through him. I didn't really learn art in class until I got to college. For most of the time, I was self-taught. Even when I got into college, I already had built the skills. And so a lot of the other stuff was theory, but he was my first teacher. That's so why I said I learned from my community. Um, he was the first victim of gun violence. And so um, he got shot in the neck, but he survived. Uh, and he would joke around and he would show me his wound, which was pretty nasty at the time. But I was only like eight years old. So um, to know somebody who was a victim of gun violence so young, which was helped me prepare for a lot of what happened when I would become a teenager, losing friends and classmates to gun violence. Um, I wouldn't say help me, but it kind of like was already, uh, already felt that already. Um, somebody so close to me. Uh, but he later passed away from a drug overdose. And so this was the, my cousins, the three generations of George that are left behind. Um, and then this is me right here watching him paint. Um, and this is him holding him as a child. So it's kind of like this full circle thing. Um, and the crazy thing is I just, before we open the q and I just saw a picture that I had of me painting this here because I was painting this scene and it looks like the same pose he's making painting this way. So I was like, this is insane. Um, but when I say this, uh, these pieces help me with trauma, I really mean this. Like I cried over this piece so many times when I was making it because I was addressing that, that, that pain 
right there on the piece. Um, so this one's close to my heart. This is one of the closest pieces to my heart. All right. I think we're about at it. Sorry about the lighting. I, I need to upgrade. I thought the shade would be cool, but it's giving me some filter light for my plants. How you doing, Nicole? Hi, hey, Joseph. Thank you so much for the talk. I think we can all agree that BC is so lucky to have you on the faculty. Oh, thank you. And um, you know, <laughs> yeah, everybody um, can really benefit from all of this. Um, this narrative that you just shared with us. Thank you so much. Um, we do have some questions. So the first one is about your students and your work at BC. Um, mm -hmm. How do your uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander students react to some of your art? And uh, what can BC do to better serve their AAPI students? I am as honest I, as I am with you guys here. I, I am honest with my students. And I think they enjoy that honesty. And, and, I, and to teach them to be proud, be proud of who they are. How can you better serve their students? Ethnic studies, man, <laughs> right? Like <laughs> give, them, give them what I got, like give them, you know, because yeah, you can learn from your family. And then I ask tons of questions now because I really want to learn, but sometimes you're just, you're just in it. And you're just trying to survive. You just, you know, just want to get through school. Um, sometimes it does help to really have that structure and knowledge and have speakers come in and to speak, right? And also to connect with the community. So BC, connect with the community, bring, we need more speakers to come in. We need uh, ethnic, ethnic studies programs. So some, a professional can come in and help build this thing up. Thank you. Um, another question, um, can undocumented inmates join your classes, um, the, the ones that are offered in the prisons, or are they barred from the registration process for, for BC classes? Uh, you gotta, I have to ask Angelica or Sabrina on that one, because I feel like we've had students that had, uh, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I know there's been things that have come up. So yeah, and that should be, they should be, right? They should be. Um, do you have a website where your portfolio is online um, that we can kind of visit on our own? Um, this person asked, it says, it's really interesting learning about how you were treated in the past and the way society was shaped back in the days. Yeah, my website, my name, it's really easy. There's not a lot of tapes in this world. There are a, a lot of them are in the Philippines or in Southern California. <laughs> so um, what was the second one again? I, I was, oh, was just I, a comment, think, right? Yeah, I think they were just commenting that your work was really impactful and um, how your life narrative has shaped that work. So, um, but yeah, we might be able to put the link to your, uh, your online portfolio in the chat so everybody can visit if they'd like. Um, another question, do you ever speak Filipino or Spanish to your children? Um, how do you keep importance of cultural identity with your family? So I do not speak either, but I, I'm trying to learn both. And that's, and I get talked to both by my grandparents and I just stare at them like, well, it's your fault. And they get mad at me, but well, you did it. And they're like, well, you, your mom didn't want to learn. You get that whole thing, right? But I think the thing is that I really tell my kids like where they're from, what they are, what to identify with. Um, and I take them to the places. So around Delano, it's the perfect place to be because there's so much history, right? There's 40 acres, it's the, the Delano Community Center. And, uh, and, um, and the, another thing that I do is I teach them how to be anti-racist. My kids are big, like when, when the, when coronavirus started and they were hearing things like uh, kids were chasing other kids and say, oh, they had the Chinese flu. My kids knew right away, like, that's not right. You can't say that. And, and they tell me, they tell the teachers and I tell the teachers and, and they, they have knowledge itself. They know who they are and where they come from. I think that's important, especially in a place like Bakersfield. Um, 
I, I speaking of Delano, I see some familiar faces behind you. Um, can you tell us about your your background and that, the mural that you're sitting in front oh, of? Oh yeah, <laughs> you guys see that? Larry Cruz and Larry Elion, man, and I learned so much about them in, in a short amount of time. Just like the Jess Nieto conference, learning so much about the other side and to see and hear both sides of the story and to be equally uh, feeling like both sides, right? I'm like, huh, I didn't get that part. Yeah, okay, they left that out from the other side and, and you put the two together and it's a very cool story. And, and to be like in the middle, right? To be like in the middle of it, it's like, oh yeah, yeah. Well, the Filipinos really started this, man. You guys left that out on the other side, but that's okay. I got you, I see you on that one. Okay, next question. Um, can you explain artivism a little bit more and how it can be used to affect change? And uh, what about your work do you think really defines it as art artivism? So, and this is what I, would, I learned long ago is that as an activist and an artist, right? Do something that is close to you, uh, uh, something that impacts you immediately, your community, um, I know you can people reach and that's okay as well. There's there's a reach there, but but uh, if if you do something that you feel you can have an impact on right away and very close, then you're doing the right thing. And for me, it was mass incarceration. All of my friends and family were getting locked up. My dad was locked up. Everybody was locked up. Why was everybody locked up? Everybody bad, right? And so for me, that was it. But then as I'm getting here. I'm starting to see thing, uh, things like the, the detention center, like hidden in plain sight and all these other things that I'm feeling even close to as well. So um, that's what it means to me is, is you be an activist, uh, and, but do something impactful close and, 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 and right away. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Next question, what do you think it will take to dismantle the system of the school to prison pipeline and how can youth of color, you know, really help themselves make it past 22 without being incarcerated or dead? Get rid of the cops on the campus. We don't need police on campus. That's the first step. You don't need police, you need help, you need counselors. You need mental health. That's the first step. It has to be rule number one, start there. Um, I, I went to a school that is, it looks like a prison, right? It's just you locked up all the way around. There's a cop car right in the front. Um, what does that do, right? Um, so I think that's step number one. That's, and there's many other things, but <laughs> that's another lecture. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, a lot of times when schools are looking at their budgets and their funding, um, Art is the first thing to go. Art, performing art, music. Um, what would you say to administration that is having to make these types of decisions? And you know why? You know what is the justification? And you know what would your, your rebuttal be to that justification of these programs aren't important? I grew up with no art in the Reagan era. They defunded the arts. They defunded all that stuff. Music was gone, right? And I'm, I'm a hip, hip hop fan because in the hip hop community, we created our own culture. We were defunded for so long and look what happened. We created a movement. Like Filipinos are known for DJing and b-boying and graffiti and, and I'm proud of that part. And I'm, I'm, I'm a lineage of that, but that was all self-taught. But that was, we taught each other. Um, and there's so much to learn through art. You can learn art. You can tie every subject matter to art. And if you don't believe me, We'll have a workshop, we'll set that up and I can show you. Even math, and I suck at math. So there's the Asian stereotype. I suck at math, <laughs> that don't work. Another Asian stereotype, I could draw good, but it's from my, my Chicano side. It's not from my Asian side. So let's debunk all these stereotypes. Yeah, and so de defunding education, that's like, they, that's the go-to thing. And that's like the worst thing you can do. Right. Um, we don't have any more questions and we're getting close to uh, five o'clock and, you know, needing to move on to the next event. But um, thank you so much. There are a ton of comments in, in the chat that I hope that you're able to get to and read. Um, thank you so much for your time. You're sharing your story. Um, 
I think even some empowerment messages that hopefully will motivate people to get out there and make a difference in, in their communities. And um, yeah, thank you so much for um, you. kicking off our conference. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it.